The warmest of greetings to you, and welcome to Happily Ever Teaching. This is the podcast to help you enthrall your learners in every subject under the sun using the best teaching method known to science, storytelling. To do this, we feature special guest educators who are passionately keen to empower your children. I am storyteller Chip Cahoon, and with me today is... Hi, I'm Helen, and I currently work with reception and year one children in Buckinghamshire. And I'm Nicola, and I currently work with year six children in Hampshire, and I've also spent time in my career hoping to motivate and inspire the next generation of teachers at Teacher Training College. And today we are exploring learning outcomes in history with our dramatisation of the Great Fire of London. You can listen to the story by downloading our sister podcast, Fables and Fairy Tales, or search our website, epictales.co.uk, for Sir Tommy's Fire. There you'll find a video of me telling the story that you can share with your children. And if you sign up as an epic educator, you'll also get a copy as a paperback illustriously illuminated by comic book artist Dave Hingley, as well as the full audiobook for you to download at any time. Right now, though, let's continue our discussion with Helen and Nicola here. And we're back in 1666 for this story. It is it is actually a, a key stage one topic, isn't it, Helen, for ages four, well, uh, five to seven? Yeah, it's one of those topics that a lot of schools teach in generally year two. Yes. Here in the UK, anyway. I don't know yes. if it's true for everywhere else in the world doing the fire of London. True. But yeah, what's the uh, history that you've pulled out from this tale? Well, it just kind of oozes history and you can hit just about all of the history curriculum objectives through the Great Fire of London. And um, the way I approached this, which I, it worked quite well and it's something you could replicate quite easily in your classroom, was I, I set the children up as a team of people. So I set the children up as Londoners. So bear with me for a minute because it it meant that we were able to hit all of the history objectives that I wanted to within drama. So I started off by, we read the story first, and then I got the children enrolled as Londoners after the fire, and they were going to rebuild London. So then this is the first kind of history link. We looked at what jobs would look like in London in 1666. In fact, we started before that, we looked at what London would look like in 1666. So we did a bit of comparing London now and then, which I think I'll talk a bit more about when we talk about geography, I think. So we looked at what London would look like, and there's a wonderful resource um, on YouTube, which I'll include. And it is called, I've got it here, Pudding Lane Productions. And if you put in Pudding Lane Productions, it comes up with this wonderful animated journey through London. 1666 before the fire so you see all the Tudor houses and what it would look like so I started there so the children had an image of what London would look like and we did some artwork around that which again I'll talk about another time uh, but then we set the children up as Londoners so we looked at what the different jobs would be comparing now and then and a lot of history in key stage one is now and then what the differences are so they looked at all the different jobs that might have been we looked at um blacksmith bakers butchers wheelwrights candle makers uh, seamstresses so the children learned about these jobs and then they took on they decided which one they wanted to be so we set them up in role in their shops rebuilding london um so this is all very fast forward the time because obviously london didn't actually get bit rebuilt <laughs> quite so quickly mm -hmm. so that's kind of the first activity as it were looking a bit at what london would have looked like in the 1600s in the 17th century and then the children as part of this drama the king wanted to make sure London was better prepared should another fire occur. Gotcha. So then we looked at how fires were fought in the 1600s. So again, that that now and then comparison, um, yeah. linking back yeah. to the science activity, looking at the equipment that they had, um, how they weren't necessarily so well prepared and how that equipment was used. So the children then, through drama, they took on this role as volunteer firefighters ready to be called upon should there be another fire. So then we did some um, training. I called them fire marshals. So they were volunteer fire marshals. So we did some training and we looked at all the equipment that was used and the methods used, you know, pulling down houses, using a fire hook, climbing up wooden ladders. We didn't actually do that. Health and safety announcement. And we had to go a bucket chain. So I got the children to spread themselves out and we passed buckets backwards and forwards. So really mm. enacting all of those ways to fight fires 
in the 1600s. So again, that's sort of a now and then activity, comparing life now and life then. Yeah. And then we did a, a little bit of role play around that. And then we came to the making improvements in London, like how London changed as a result of the fire, what changes were made, which is another important learning aspect. So one of the key stage, I think it's probably key stage two as well, but one of the key stage one curriculum objectives is all about important, significant events. So that this covers so much of the curriculum. And in 1667, there was the great, I think it was called the Rebuilding Act of 1667, and it laid out how London should be rebuilt. It's obviously very long and complicated, um, but the children, again, in, in their role in their drama, were tasked with thinking about what improvements should be made. They then learned about the improvements that were, were made. So widening the streets, houses no longer made of wood and straw, but made of stone and brick. Yeah, There was also to do with the overhangs of the houses and the signs along the streets. Shouldn't, there, there shouldn't be so much hanging off the houses that can catch fire. So that the children learned about all of these changes that were made because of the significant events and were tasked with redesigning Pudding Lane based on the changes. I hope that kind of makes sense. It was a lot of a lot of history learning within drama. Yeah. And um, they, yeah. they took on these roles of Londoners and volunteer fire marshals. And within those roles, they learned a lot about the Great Fire of London, the changes that were made afterwards, the causes of the fire. And what, what's so beautiful about those ideas, uh, alongside your passion for it, because you clearly really do enjoy <laughs> teaching this subject. Dude, we had a good time. Um, it was a good one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it sounds as if you're able to get so much else in there as well, like all the literacy that you were talking about earlier, the different bits of writing they could yes. do and the investigations into what they need to do better, the, the persuasive arguments and so on. That could all be entwined in this. And I was thinking as well, going right back to um, the start of last week when we were talking about um, mistakes in PSHE. This is a brilliant example of showing how sometimes mistakes can be good things because, you know, the Fire of London was one massive yes. mistake um, <laughs> and yet it allowed there to be these changes for the better, yeah. this uh, chance to rebuild and do things differently. So um, it's one huge history topic yeah. with uh, a really good uh, a really good moral, I suppose, that things do get better following a tragedy. Yes. Yeah, that's why I like it so much. <laughs> it's just so engaging for the children. There's just so so much fantastic learning. And then again, you know, through the drama that we did, the children met some of the different significant people because that's another key element of history is learning about significant yeah, individuals. Yeah. So they met King Charles and Thomas Bloodworth and then Samuel Pepys as well and, and Thomas Fariner and all of these key characters that they learn about and learn about their role. Yeah. So uh, hopefully there's plenty there that schools and educators, even outside of the UK, would be able to pick up on and, and use. But when you start getting above the age of seven, Nicola, do you ever come back to the Fire of London? Is there stuff here that you would work with? Not officially, because it's not officially part of the curriculum in, in the UK in Key Stage 2. However, if you have the story... There's absolutely no reason why you couldn't use it as a discrete sort of maybe a, a two week unit, because there is, like Helen said, so much history. And the fact that we're now entering a period of time where we've got evidence, real evidence, we've got um, art, we've got written accounts and so on of the time means it becomes so much richer and so much easier yeah, richer to teach because there's accounts from the time that then the children can interpret. So they, they mm. become real historians. And I think um, something that's important is to help children to look at different sources of information and think which are the best sources of information and how do they help us learn about the past. So I would focus my history and I would definitely come back to it for older children, even if it's been covered by younger children, they'll remember it with great love from the wonderful activities that you've done, Helen, um, in your, <laughs> your school. And, and they then can look specifically then more at different sources of information. So looking yeah. at um, the diary entries, looking at old maps and thinking about which sources are richer and better, thinking about primary sources, secondary sources of information and so on, which then goes into older children again. So it's children age 11 plus will spend more time doing that at their next schools. I think a nice activity would be to look at old maps of London 
from the time and compare them to maps today. Obviously, that comes into geography, which I know we're talking about next. Um, but you've mentioned maps and it's already got a sound of approval from Helen. So. <laughs> always, always. No, I mean, there's, again, because we've got that evidence, it's there. We can, we can see yeah. it. It's it's not made up. It's not secondary. It's primary evidence. As I'll, I'll come back to in geography, but I, th- I still think it's history, finding places on the map and then thinking mm-hmm. about the order of the events of the fire, the chronology of the events, because Again, for older children, chronology comes up a lot, sequencing events and finding the Pudding Lane on the map, finding the Tower of London, finding St Paul's Cathedral. And again, you could then compare that map to today. You could even compare it to pre-World War II and then post-World War II, which would be quite interesting as well, because obviously there were effects on London in those times too, Yeah, just the, using maps to help us learn about the past. Yeah, definitely. It would be interesting if you have had a a cohort who've heard the story or experienced Mm -hmm. this aspect of history from before, seeing how much they remember and seeing if they still have an idea over who the main culprit was, who caused it and who the main villains were, and then maybe presenting them with some new sources Mm -hmm. or some richer sources like you were mentioning and seeing if their ideas change now that they are um, age nine or 10 or 11. Yeah, definitely. I think they will remember it, like I say, because it's been taught so effectively and it is one of those areas that is so rich, like Helen said, in so many different things that you can do with it that they will remember. So yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and, and, and looking at, I think I'll come back to this one, talk about art, but looking at some of the artwork from the time and how does that help us and and whose perspective is it written from? Because obviously when you look at sources of information, they're very biased. So trying to get a balanced idea of of who it's coming from and why they might think that is also important. Yes, yeah. That could come into their newspaper articles that we talked about a few podcasts ago. (laughs) Oh, yes. That's all we have time for in this episode, folks. If you'd like to talk to us about anything you've heard in this podcast, or if there's a subject you are soon to teach that you'd like us to cover, you can find us on social media using at Teach Happily, or leave us a review using your favorite podcast app. Please also share this podcast with your colleagues and help us start a story-led revolution in classrooms around the world, so children everywhere can learn in a way that's effective, memorable, and enjoyable all at the same time. Tomorrow, Sir Tommy and the people of Restoration London will help us plan lessons in the unusual pairing of geography and physical education. But right now, it only remains for us to say cheerio, and we hope to hear your story soon. So, cheerio, and we we hope hope to hear your your story story soon. soon.